Good morning, everyone. My name is Hans Johnson, and I'm the director of the Higher Education Center at the Public Policy Institute of California. I would like to welcome you to today's uh, presentation and panel discussion uh, on a report PPIC recently released called Higher Education and Economic Opportunity in California. I think this is a really opportune time to have this presentation and discussion. As we all know, uh, our country and our state have some sharp economic divides, and we believe that education and educational mobility are key to helping us resolve some of those divides. Uh, we would like to very much thank the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Spencer Foundation, and the Sutton Family Fund for their support of this research and for this virtual event. The um, complete report, along with the technical appendix uh, and the slides from today's presentation are available at www.ppic.org. So what we're going to do uh, this morning is first, I will briefly in about 15 minutes, walk through uh, some of the major findings of the report. And then I will invite our esteemed panelists to join me for a discussion about how to broaden the benefits of a college degree including strategies for expanding access and completion in California's higher education systems. And finally, we will have time uh, to answer audience questions. If you have a question for our panelists, please send an email uh, to the address on the screen. That's ppiceventquestions at gmail.com. Uh, and we would appreciate you including your name uh, and organization along with your question. And with that, uh, let me begin the presentation. So I am going to share my screen. And I think we're good to go. So one of the um, tremendous uh, opportunities for me in this, uh, in this work has been working with uh, Marisol Cuellar Mejia, my co-author, and with uh, 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 Cesar Perez, who provided research support. It's been a, a project we care about a lot, and um, the work, I think, really matters a, a lot. So uh, just in terms of briefly where, where we're going with this, um, we know that higher education is a ladder of economic opportunity. Um, and so first of all, I'm going to show a little bit of evidence on how college graduates experience large economic benefits in California. And then we'll talk about the gaps that exist in terms of who's able to access uh, those benefits. And that is specifically by going through our uh, education system and finally uh, earning a, a degree. Our focus is on a bachelor's degree in this work right now. We've done other work looking at uh, career education uh, in, in the community colleges and certificates. And then finally, we'll have a discussion uh, about how California and its higher education institutions can provide low income and historically underrepresented students, Latinos and African-Americans in particular with the information, access and support they need to reach their educational goals. So first of all, economic benefits. We know uh, that, student, uh, that um, people who graduate with a bachelor's or graduate degree earn far higher wages than less educated individuals. This has been the case for many years. And in fact, that difference between wages of college graduates and less educated individuals has grown over time. Here, we're showing you uh, figures for 2018, which are in the uh, greenish bars, and then uh, inflation adjusted figures for 1980. And the other thing to notice about this is not just the difference between education groups, but is also that over time, wages have been largely stagnant for people with an associate's degree, a high school graduate, graduate um, diploma, or who have not graduated from high school at all, compared to fairly robust uh, wage gains for people with a bachelor's degree or graduate degree. So what about uh, the recession and what's happening right now? So here um, is a very broad view uh, and one view of what's happening in our labor markets. This is actually for the United States. California would look very similar, um, but we have more recent data from the United States. And what you'll see are, are several things here. First of all, um, the number of workers with less than a bachelor's degree has not changed much in the United States. And in fact, uh, even before the pandemic recession, it was lower than it was prior to the Great Recession. So there's been fairly stagnant job growth for less educated individuals in our country. Um, and then the pandemic recession affected them far more 
than it has affected people with a bachelor's degree or more. Both have had, of course, um, uh, declines in employment, and uh, there are you know, genuine uh, issues with uh, college graduates as well looking for jobs. But still, I mean, in terms of magnitude, it's not nearly the effect that we've seen for less educated individuals. And the other thing to notice about this is that that green line has been steadily increasing upwards. So even as wage gains have been occurring for college graduates, the number of jobs available to them has also been increasing. So this is a clear sign of strong labor market demand uh, and also that those workers are more insulated in recessions than uh, less educated workers. Okay, so now let's talk about the pipeline and how we're doing in California in terms of preparing students for this labor market. And what we've done uh, is for the first time, as far as I know, developed a pathway from high school, uh, from ninth grade actually, all the way through high school completion, then into college, then focusing on four-year colleges, and then find, finally earning a bachelor's degree. The technical details of how we develop these, uh, the, these pathways are, are in the report. Um, but the main message here is that we see low-income students, that's the gold lines, are much less likely to complete each one of these uh, transitions successfully than high-income students. So first of all, we see a difference in terms of uh, high school completion, 81% for low-income, 92% for middle and high-income. And those differences actually widen, especially uh, when we talk about attending a four-year college and then finally, at the end of the day, earning a bachelor's degree. So that low-income students in California are less than half as likely to earn a, eventually earn a bachelor's degree than middle and high-income students. We've also looked at this in terms of race and ethnicity, and the numbers are, are similar in some ways. Uh, a large share of Latino and African-American students uh, in California are from low-income backgrounds. About 80% of high school students who are low-income are uh, either Latino, African-American, or from another group that's underrepresented among college graduates. And you'll see here again, uh, the rate of college completion at the end of the day is about half as high for Latinos and African-Americans as it is for whites, and about a third as high for, um, as it is for, for Asians. And then finally, we've also looked at these pathways, um, just looking at low income uh, groups uh, by race and ethnic uh, identity. And again, uh, here you see uh, that low income whites, low income Latinos and low income Asians all have very similar uh, pathways uh, towards earning a bachelor's degree. Low income Asians are, are, are about twice as likely to earn a bachelor's degree as the other low income groups. So in general, these point to key leverage points where we can identify policies and practices that can help improve student outcomes. And many of those leverage points are actually in the higher education sector or higher education reaching down uh, to, to K-12. So I think a particular note here is this the second set of bars, which is among high school graduates, the share of low income versus middle and high income students that enroll in a community, col uh, enroll in a community college is, is actually very similar. The big difference is among high school graduates, the share that enroll in a four-year college. And we've also done this work by race, ethnicity, uh, and that's in the report uh, for the sake of time today, we're gonna be focusing on income. But you'll see low-income students are only about half as likely to enroll directly into a four-year college from high school as a freshman than middle and high-income students. Uh, a second key leverage point here where we need to make gains is among community college students the share that transfer to a four-year college Again, it's very different uh, by income. And then finally, we see substan substantial differences uh, even among those who finally make it to a four-year college. And realize, you know, these low-income students have made it to a four-year college, have jumped through a lot of hoops. They've done everything we've asked of them, either in high school to get in as freshmen or going through a very difficult transfer process. Uh, and still there's this gap. So this, is, in some ways, is kind of the, the lowest hanging fruit. Okay. So let's talk uh, very briefly about each one of these steps. So the first one is that high school to college transition, especially that four-year college transition where we saw these differences. And here I'm showing you uh, the A through G. Those are the college preparatory courses that high school students need to take to be eligible, to be considered for UC. Uh, that's the University of California and CSU. That's California State University. And there's two things to, to notice here. First, there are large differences across race and ethnic group and, across, and by income. 
Uh, the other thing to notice is that things are getting a lot better. Um, by 2018-19, over half of California's high school uh, gra graduates had completed these college prep courses, a huge increase over just 10 years ago, and that that's been true for every race and ethnic group. So there's real progress happening here, but we still see these uh, uh, racial and ethnic inequalities and income inequalities. Uh, finally, uh, well, not finally, but um, next, when we think about how to, you know, what are some of the impediments to accessing uh, a four-year college in particular, we know that cost is one of them. Um, and so here I'm showing you the net cost. Uh, so for uh, low-income students, those who come from families making less than $30,000 a year who attend um, uh, one of our higher education institutions in California. And you'll see that even though UC and CSU are a lot more affordable, for example, than private nonprofits on, on average, that even so, uh, $7,000 to $9,000 uh, for a student coming from a family making less than $30,000 a year is quite burdensome. And of course, what happens is many of those students take out, take out loans. Uh, the California community colleges are the most affordable in uh, this net cost scenario. But even there, again, the costs are not uh, insignificant. Okay, and then let's turn to once students are in those four-year colleges and universities, um, how many of them graduate? Uh, this is six-year graduation rates, again, broken down by different sectors. And again, you'll see these differences are evident between low-income students and middle and high-income students. So at the end of the day, um, we are fortunate in California to have a large and robust higher education system with public higher education playing a really prominent role. Um, we need to do more, though, to help integrate our programs and policies and to really focus on low income and underrepresented students. So one of our first recommendations is that while we have some really, um, I think, fantastic high school outreach and preparation programs, they are often of small scale, not sufficiently targeted, uh, and in particular, need to reach students when they can make decisions about um, going about college. So for example, junior high school students need to know about the A through G, uh, middle school students need to know about the A through G requirements before they enter high school, not when they're seniors. Secondly, we need to develop an aggressively inclusive admissions process. And that needs to really focus on aggressively inclusive of low income students. Proposition 16 looks like it's going to fail. Of course, as believers in democracy, all votes need to be counted and they haven't yet been counted in California, but it looks like right now it's going to fail. So this means focusing on low income students uh, is even more important in that admissions process. Uh, and certainly there are no restrictions to considering a student's economic background. It is part of the criteria that's used by UC and CSU in admitting students. We recommend that it be elevated uh, and be promoted as an even more important part of that decision. And we could talk about that maybe uh, in, the, in the panel discussion about exactly how we might do that. Uh, the transfer um, process is one that holds lots of promise. There's been lots of improvements. We have a report out recently that shows uh, some real hopeful signs with uh, changes in how students uh, go through the remediation process at, uh, at the California Community Colleges that's going to lead, we believe, to a large increase in the number of students who are transfer eligible. But at the end of the day, there has to be capacity for them at UC and CSU, and uh, there have to be more seamless pathways for them. The associate degree for transfer is a great example of one that's been very successful, but it is also an example of what's not quite working. It's all, those are only agreements between community colleges and the California State University system. The University of California does not yet participate fully in that program. Uh, many private nonprofits do. And um, some majors, some really important majors are not well represented. For example, out of the over 100 California community colleges, only about a third have computer science uh, as one of the associate degree for transfers. Zero have engineering. Uh, as an associate degree for transfer. So we need to do more to expand to those majors that in, in have very high labor market uh, demand. Uh, unifying course requirements is another part of this. Common course numbering would be great, but certainly you know, having one set of lower division course requirements for one UC or CSU campus versus another makes it really hard for students to efficiently make it through that transfer pathway. 
Uh, and then finally, we know that for higher education to be meaningfully accessible to low income and underrepresented students, it needs to be uh, financially available to them. So California has a good track record compared to many other states in providing financial aid. But we, I think, need to figure out ways to do more and to help low income students sustain those pathways that they're on in our higher education systems. And finally, um, a part of that, of course, are student services, again, that really need to be targeted towards the students who are most at risk, which include low income students uh, and students who are from underrepresented backgrounds. At the end of the day, if we uh, make further progress, and I think we have been making progress, so I am optimistic, but we have a long ways to go. Uh, we will have a more equitable society. We'll have fewer economic divisions. We will have more um, equity in terms of educational attainment, and that will serve all of us. So I think the call uh, is, is, is a, an important one, and um, I appreciate our panelists who are going to help us talk about this further. So uh, right now I would like to uh, welcome our panelists and remind you again to send your uh, questions to ppiceventquestions at gmail.com. So I am going to stop sharing my presentation here. And um, I think now uh, I will be joined by the panelists and let me introduce them. We have Laonde Ajose. She is the Senior Policy Advisor for Higher Education in the Officer in the office of the governor. Uh, we are also joined by Lauren Blanchard. He is the executive vice chancellor for academic and student affairs at the California State University System Office. And finally, we have Marlene Garcia, who is the executive director of the California Student Aid Commission. Thank you so much, all of you, for being here today. Thank you for inviting us. I'd like to start off um, the discussion, and as a reminder to our viewers, um, I'll ask a few questions and then we'll turn it over to the audience. Uh, Lande, uh, as Senior Policy Advisor to, to the Governor, I know that these issues that I've just talked about are uh, core issues for you. They've been a, the big issues for you for a long time in, in, in your career. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you and the governor's office are thinking about education and educational mobility, and perhaps even, uh, this is a big, big question, I guess, but also, you know, in the face of our current times with, with the recession and um, uh, getting people back to work and, and through, through our higher education system. Yeah, thank you so much for asking me to join the panel, uh, Hans, and also thank you for the question. Um, I think one thing I would just underscore is that in this particular moment, um, these issues are, are front and center for the administration. Um, you know, I, I was struck as I was thinking about the slides and working working through some of the data that money, a lot of this data was uh, collected, analyzed, uh, the report was written, um, you know, not necessarily with the data uh, reflecting what has happened this past year. And so many of the trends that are presented in your data don't even account for how dire circumstances are for many of our students and our institutions uh, in light of COVID-19 and the, uh, the, the attendant recession and of course, uh, the, the racial reckoning that is happening across the nation and on our campuses. So, so I, I start with that because I think the data definitely show you know, that there are just tremendous inequities that exist for our students uh, and that we need to double down our efforts. You know, we have seen trends such as um, the community colleges uh, having a lower enrollment than, than we would have ever expected in the midst of a recession. And I think we have to ask the question as to, as to why and what is happening with those, with those students. So, so I guess that's the first comment I would say. Um, you know, I think in terms of the things that the administration is doing, there are a, a few. One is uh, immediately uh, following um, the, the pandemic, the governor had convened a task force that is really looking very carefully at jobs and economy and what it means to reboot the economy. We've had a hundred um, uh, leaders from business and industry, nonprofits, philanthropy, civic organizations thinking with us about what does it mean for this economy to restart and what uh, are, the, are the, the jobs in the near term that we can, so we can put people back to work and that body of work has been happening adjacent to the work that the Commission on the Future of Work has been doing, which is really has the long view, right? They're thinking about 
2030 and beyond? And what does the, the shape of the California's labor market and California's industrial sector look like? And how do we assure that there's alignment between those two things with a, with a goal towards really thinking about um, high quality jobs and jobs that pay. And you can't think about those two things without understanding what is unique to California. And that is the robustness, the richness, the quality of our higher education system and the ways in which it provides tremendous access to so many Californians. And so we have been thinking and, and we are shaping up reports right now, particularly the Future of Work report, uh, we expect to be out sometime in late December to really think about what's the long-term trajectory and where does the higher education system fit into that. Um, I think as we as we think about that, we're definitely thinking about, you know, are there, what, what trends do we know going forward will be in significant and important. We have had a lot of conversations, for example, about the care economy, which ranges, you know, from childcare to nursing and knowing that we have an aging population, knowing that we, we have a lot of needs there. Are there ways that we can think about advancing uh, the, the economy and advancing uh, economic mobility using economies you know, like, like the care economy and ensuring that those are uh, strong jobs for individuals? Are there ways that we need to be thinking about a social safety net for individuals who are gonna be a part of uh, what has traditionally been call, uh, called contingent work and how do we look at that? So there are a number of things, but what we know is unique to California is that we have this amazing world-class higher education system and that we need to invest in that because that is not going anywhere. Uh, we need to continue to invest in that both because it is intrinsically a part of the state and also because it is where it is the, the opportunity structure that we have developed in this state to allow for economic mobility for Californians across the state, whether it's the Central Valley, the Inland Empire, Imperial County, Los Angeles, San Francisco, so and, and the far north as well. So I think that those are some of the things that, that we are doing within the administration to really think about that. Thanks so much, uh, Lande. Lauren, um, you know, uh, we had some information we presented here on California State University, but there's a lot, of, a much larger story to tell. I and mean, certainly, CSU already has an amazing track record of serving a diverse set of students, including a large share of low-income students. The Quality of Opportunity Project has shown that uh, they provide some of the greatest ladders of economic and educational mobility in the country, some of your campuses. But we also know that there's room to do more. And I know that CSU has set some ambitious goals for, for what it would like to see, both in terms of uh, the number of students it serves, and improving their success in the system. So could you talk to us a, a little bit about those? Uh, so thank you so much, Hans. And, and I really appreciate uh, the invitation to be a part of this discussion today and also really appreciate uh, sharing these results with us. You know, I'm, I'm really proud to represent uh, the California State University, which is for most of you uh, know, the largest and most ethnically and economically a diverse public university in the country and uh, arguably, I believe, one of the most, uh, uh, the greatest socioeconomic escalators uh, within our state and within our nation. And as you described um, earlier, Hans, that the proven lifelong benefits of a degree from California State University for all of our students, that, that those benefits are just unassailable lifting not only our graduates uh, and their families, but enriching our communities, enriching our state, and also enriching our nation. So with, with continued state investment, uh, the, the CSU is on track to deliver more than 128,000 highly skilled and job ready graduates each year that we expect to champion innovation, to enrich the diversity of our workforce, to dismantle systemic racism that Lunde just talked about, and to develop solutions for the challenges of our lifetimes. And these individuals, as they graduate, they will join the 3.8 million global alumni uh, that will bring forth, as you pointed out, Hans, nearly $1 million of additional buying power, each to infuse California's economy and to propel our recovery here in California, and certainly those that are uh, in other parts of the nation as well. In my estimation, uh, perhaps best of all is that we know that our graduates have a tendency to pay it forward and inspire others to follow in their path um, and you know setting a pattern of, of upward mobility that will elevate future generations to come. 
So given these undeniable benefits, I believe that collectively in the state of California, and I say collectively, I'm talking about this segment, the pipeline segment from K-12 or PK all the way uh, throughout higher education, that we really do have a moral obligation to ensure genuine access to an affordable, high quality education experience for all students, regardless of their income, their background, their gender, their race, their ethnicity, or their status. And that's certainly what we have been uh, proud in being able to deliver at the California State University. Um, and, and we're starting to see some of those successes. Um, in the, the CSU, we're currently educating about 486,000 students uh, throughout the state. Uh, more than half of our students are students of color. 43% uh, receive Pell grants and one third are first in their families to attend college. And our students are more diverse than they've ever been before. 62% uh, of all bachelor's degrees granted to California's Latinx students are conferred by the CSU, as well as 47% of bachelor's degrees granted to uh, our state's African-American students and 43% of bachelor's degrees uh, that are granted to American Indian and, and Alaska Native students. And despite the pandemic, I know this is gonna sound hard to believe when you look at national data, but here at the CSU, we're celebrating our largest student body ever this fall. Um, thanks to an increase of uh, the new transfer students uh, that we've been working very hard with the community colleges, especially with the ADT programs that you just mentioned earlier, Hans, and a record retention rate with 85.5% of our first year students returning for a second year. And this past May, we graduated our largest class ever. Uh, a total of nearly 129,000 students, which has led to re record graduation rates for both first time students and for transfer students. And while all of this is really good news, the great news will come, Hans um, and, and others, the day that we will be able to announce that we have eliminated equity gaps across the California State University. As you mentioned earlier, this is an area of stubbornness. Um, but we're definitely dedicated and are going to continue to ensure that all of our students, regardless of what walk of life that they come from, that these gaps for low income students and for students of color will continue to be unacceptable to us and that we're going to work very diligently to ensure that we're able to eliminate them. So, you know, on the strategy side, and I'll, I'll be brief on these, that, you know, we're fortunate that our current chancellor, Tim White, has already built a legacy of initiatives aimed at expanding college access and completion, closing the equity gaps, and supporting all of our students. And as Chancellor White, as most of us know, is setting his sights on retirement really soon now, our board of trustees has named a chancellor select whom I believe, and certainly I think I know that our board of trustees believe is perfectly suited to carry out this vision. Dr. Joseph I. Castro will step into his role as our new chancellor starting on January 4th. And you know, Dr. Castro is a proud California native and, and a first generation college graduate himself born in the San Joaquin Valley as the grandson of immigrants from Mexico. I am certain that under Castro's leadership that we will continue to build upon a lot of the efforts that we've already started to extend the lifelong benefits of a high quality degree to all Californians. So here are some of our strategies that I just wanna be clear about. First of all, one idea that we must embrace, and you, you've pointed this out very well, Hans, is that from preschool to career, California students belong to all of us. Many of the CSU student success and equity efforts are rooted in our K-12 schools and our community colleges. And the CSU also has, has had numerous community partnerships, bridge programs, pipeline programs, promise programs in place that automatically connect K-12 through students with higher education and do it in such a way that when those students actually reach our doors, that they're no strangers to us. Uh, and, and we are no strangers to them. We know them and they know us. Um, and that this really helps to guide these underserved students toward a higher demand fields um, while giving them an early sense of belonging on our respective campuses. With respect to recruitment and admission, also something that you highlighted, once we have these young people hooked on the idea of college at CSU, 
uh, that we've worked hard to create seamless pathways for their success. Uh, thanks to a partnership with the college with the California College Guidance Initiative, that's a mouthful, um, any K-12 or community college student, their parents or guidance counselors, they can log on at any point to college, californiacolleges.edu, californiacolleges.edu, which is a free and comprehensive college and career planning guide that is integrated with the Cal State application for admissions. We're really working hard to ensure that all high school graduates arrive on our campuses with the critical thinking skills they need to succeed by partnering with us to improve preparation, uh, even in the area of quantitative reasoning. This will undoubtedly, we believe, open many more doors for underserved students that are seeking high demand, high paying jobs in the STEM field. And lastly, for our incoming transfer students, we work closely with the California Community Colleges on sustaining and enhancing associate degrees for transfer that we mentioned earlier to give students really straightforward paths and, and guidance and support to the CSU campus uh, as their major of choice. We know as well that the cost of college can certainly be a deterrent um, and with a commitment to affordability, certainly on the tuition side, uh, but also in terms of other ways where we really work to ensure that our cost of attendance, not just the tuition, but the cost of attendance remains low by offering free open educational um, resources and rental programs for books uh, to offset the, the expense that we have. So the last thing I'll mention is that, you know, when we, we talk about the work that we've got to get done uh, around the equity side of this, that I believe wholeheartedly that the hardest part of our work is making sure that we're providing what I call support services on steroids. And which brings me to GI 2025, which is the graduation initiative 2025, our flagship effort to close equity gaps and to really help more students secure the lifelong benefits of a CSU degree. Uh, we've been working very hard over the years, actually since 2015. Um, and, and as a part of that initiative, we know that there are way too many stumbling blocks for our students, especially those that come from underserved backgrounds as, as well as um, economically deprived backgrounds. And so we've been hiring more faculty. We've been improving course access. We've been providing dedicated space and programming and staff to support our first generation students and all of our students of color. Um, I, I'll say uh, lastly that you know, our full range of academic wellness and social support really has been evolving into a way that we've got this seamless way that we're providing support to all of our students and to make sure that they remain engaged. And more importantly, that they complete our, the CSU with a degree, a degree of value that says that these students are ready for the workforce. They're ready for graduate and a professional school. And for those who haven't quite figured it out, that they're ready to continue their own personal journey to better understand where their lives will lead them. Uh, with all this stated, I just can, can't say enough how important uh, the findings of, of your study is to us. Uh, and that more importantly, we're gonna work uh, as hard as we can, especially given the pandemic and beyond the pandemic uh, to ensure that we can continue to adapt uh, and change quickly when necessary. Um, and that more importantly, that we're gonna ensure that CSU remains an attainable goal, an attainable pathway for students of all backgrounds, especially those that come from underserved backgrounds, uh, to know that CSU is going to be there to support them and help them to build the strong foundation and in the spirit and the tradition that we know how. I'll stop there, Hans. Thanks, <clears throat> Lauren. Uh, especially encouraging to hear that your enrollments are up even in the face of the, the pandemic. So many of us, I think, have been worried about students stopping out of their higher education pathways. And so that's good news indeed. Marlene, I mean, I think underlying all these discussions is, is financial aid. So you're gonna solve that for us then. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, seriously, I, you know, there's some good news, right? California has uh, among the most generous, if not the most generous financial aid policies as a state through our Cal grants. Um, and yet we know that low income students still have uh, serious challenges in being able to afford college. So I'm wondering if you could, uh, for some of our viewers, they won't even know about our Cal Grant program. Yeah, you know, I know there's a lot of parts to it, but maybe you could just briefly describe what, what we have been doing as a state and, and 
and what your agency has been doing. Um, and then uh, items that you're thinking about in terms of moving forward with financial aid in, in California. Thank you, Hans. And um, thank you for having me on this uh, panel, having this great discussion um, with uh, our, some of our strongest leaders in California. Um, and thank you for your report. Um, I just have to say your report so clearly underscores what we really already know, but it's just so stark that the data you offer shows that the students who are not accessing college, not persisting and not graduating are poor and racially and ethnically diverse students and they're largely black and brown. And so this is 2020 and we're still, the data is still so stark. We've made progress and I think it's, we've made tremendous progress and I think our institutions in the state of California have um, done a great job in trying to move the needle. But what it tells us today in this moment um, is that we have a lot of work to do, but with data and research like what you've provided, it really helps bring clarity to what those challenges are and where those levers are to affect change. So I really appreciate the research you've done today and, and um, really you know, caused me to think more strategically about where those areas are that we can affect change. So in terms of um, my organization, so I run the California Student Aid Commission. It is the largest financial aid institution in the country. We um, provide more than $2.4 billion in um, resources to fund financial aid, primarily the Cal Grant program, which is really one of the most generous programs in the country. We guarantee an award to students who meets specific um, baseline requirements, meaning income need and some and some GPA requirements uh, within one year out of high school. So California makes a deep commitment to these students and has a history, a legacy of really helping students pay for tuition and fees. And uh, we serve almost a half a million students annually with these types of awards. So I'm really, you know, I, I, I realize that um, there's, there, this is such a key part of what we do. But what we also know is that that's not the full cost of attendance. You know, the, the Cal Grant program does currently fund primarily tuition and fees. The majority of the resources do cut, uh, do go towards covering tuition and fees for students attending institutions in California, public and independent and private. Um, but the students who don't attend institutions that have large fees are um, have access to an access award, which are really the awards that are um, covering basic needs. And we have a small number of students in the four years, but a really large number of students in the community colleges. That, that's, that's really the, what they get in terms of California-based financial aid. And um, in the past year, we've engaged in a couple of surveys that have been really significant and telling uh, for us about students. So one survey is the Sears survey, which many of you are familiar with, the Student Expense and Resources Report. We issued that late last year. And that basically you know, was eye-opening and underscored, yes, students are struggling. Cost of living in California has changed dramatically in the past decades when you know, student, the cost of attendance, the main driver is not just tuition and fees anymore. Um, and we, what we learned was, was you know, really uh, heart wrenching that in any given month, one in three students are experiencing food and or housing insecurity. So that's where you hear about the students living in their cars, the students eating only once a day. That's real. Um, the second survey we did was the COVID-19 survey this past spring was right after, it was done in May, right after the reality and the enormity of COVID was starting to sink in for all of us. And we surveyed students. And again, the, 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 what we learned from the students and we surveyed, it was one of the largest surveys in the country. We surveyed all of our financial aid um, database and, uh, and we um, uh, close to 72,000 students responded, which is what made it the largest survey in the country. And what we learned again was heart-wrenching. The students um, basically were saying that their lives have been upended. They have 
considerably increase worry about what the future holds. But one data point that stuck with me was more than 70% of the students said that they had lost some or all of their income. So if they were already struggling living in their cars, trying to figure out what to eat back when we did the, the Sears survey, what's happening to them now? So that was really um, disconcerting. We knew it was going to be a challenging year for students. And we knew that a lot of students, the ones who are gonna be hurt the most in this multi-layered crisis, um, are the, the poorest and the students of color. They're the ones who are already on the edge trying to make ends meet. So you lose your job, even if it is a part-time job and you lose all your income, if you're already on your own trying to cover your basic needs, now what do you have? So, you know, I'm really grateful that California hasn't followed the enrollment patterns that we've seen around the country and real shout out to CSU and UC for, for, for really, and I've heard stories about the aggressive outreach that went on to keep students enrolled. But in their community colleges, the story isn't as positive. We've seen a lot of drop off in enrollment. And I'm also concerned about what's gonna happen for students who are in high school now or adults who are thinking about how am I gonna reskill upskill um, to be uh, equipped to get a job in this changing economy, especially once the recession um, starts to, to go away. And um, we're not, we haven't stopped worrying about what's happening to students' decision-making patterns about college. And so affordability to us is at the core for the communities that your report has addressed. And so we are really making it a point to look at ways in which we can focus to, 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 to rethink how we deliver financial aid. And of course, many of you are familiar with the work that's being done on Cal Grant modernization. We have this beautiful, nice report with a set of proposal, a proposal and recommendations. We had broad support. And then of course, COVID hit and everything just, you know, we had to take a pause and take a breath and figure out where we were in this world. Um, but we're now, re, re, we're, we're, we've been asked to rethink about this proposal, but without new funding. So we're talking to our partners now, our stakeholder partners, and trying to get, you know, input on how we can do this and how we can at least establish a framework, an equity framework that helps really highlight the fact that we need to address these basic needs and we need to do it in the context of cost of attendance. And so we're hopeful that we're going to make some progress in um, January and be able to really work with our partners, institutions, social justice advocates, of course, you know, our, our colleagues, Londe and folks in the Department of Finance, you know, we can't, we have to come to this together and figure out how we address these needs. The one area that I was so struck in your report was your recommendation to incentivize uh, increasing college admissions to more low-income students, which means it has implications for financial aid. And I really do think we have to take some bold steps to, if we want, if the end goal is to have a thriving, strong uh, economic recovery. Um, but I did thought, I, I really found your slide helpful about the net cost for students attending college. And that's essentially the basic needs area that we need to really think about. How do we close that gap? We can do some with access awards. We can do some with better connection with CalFresh um, benefits. We can do so better connection with different kinds of resources that are out there, especially if we can draw from the federal government, if Pell Grants were to increase. But that for CSU, it's that 74, 7,478. For UC, it's 9,000. For the community college, it's 5,000. How do we close that gap? Because that's where the students either take out loans and usually bad loans, or worse yet, we have some new data that shows that students are turning to credit card debt to close the gap on those basic needs. So that net cost is a real issue. And I'm really appreciative of your report because I know this is gonna be what we're laser focused on in terms of how we craft a solution going forward. Um, and I just want to do one um, last uh, shout out to we're going to be hosting the College Affordability Summit on November 17th. Um, we urge you all to register. We are going to have a great lineup of uh, leaders, experts, including our very own Londe Josi here. And uh, we, we think it'll be an opportunity to have these kinds of conversations. So thank you.
Uh, uh, thanks, Marlene, and thanks uh, to all the panelists. You, you answered my question and more, so I really super appreciate that. I'd love, um, I, I wanna turn to the audience uh, questions now, um, although I'm gonna preempt the first question with just something, if you could really briefly talk about the budget situation and um, uh, specifically, uh, and, and I don't know that anybody has answers to this because things are changing so fast, Specifically, are there efficiencies to be gained? Um, I think it's really difficult in these times just to say, well, we just all need more money, although that's you know true too. And so how do we um, be efficient in, in doing what we do? Is there, are there lessons to be learned from, from the COVID pandemic? Is online learning something that might be able to help? Londe, I know you've thought about these topics for a long time and you're central there. Um, and I don't expect any of you to have answers, but if you could just briefly give us a little bit of your thinking about the, the budget situation and, and what that means for your, for your institutions. Um, and um, Marlene, I think you've already talked about like CalFresh as, as, uh, as, uh, as one way to be effective and efficient and addressing some basic student concerns. So I think that's great. But Londe and Lauren, maybe you could uh, add on here. And, and by all means, Marlene, I don't mean to exclude you from that because you already answered part of it, but. Um, why don't we start with Londe and then go to Lauren? Sure. Um, you know, I mean, the budget situation is on all of our minds. You don't uh, weather a $54.3 billion deficit uh, lightly and, um, and then turn around and, and, and have, have uh, you know, have things be hunky dory. So we are really thinking about the budget situation. I have to imagine, and, and I, I say this with all due respect, I have to imagine that there are additional efficiencies to be gained. Um, you know, what I really appreciate about what Lauren said earlier is that these are all our students. And I think far too often we approach them as the students of a particular system. Um, and actually, um, one of the things that we have been talking about, and I didn't mention it earlier, but one of the approaches that we are thinking about at the, the level of the governor's office is uh, we've convened a task force that is focused on recovery with equity to look at, as we think about recovering from the pandemic and the recession, how do we do so in a way that guarantees additional increased equity for all of California students uh, from where we were a year ago? Um, there's nothing predetermined about um, how we understood or defined or observed what equity looked like in January of 2020, and we don't have to return there. We can actually use this moment as an opportunity to break through what perhaps are some um, uh, uh, sacred cows and really think about what's the new definition of equity in a post-pandemic world. And so that's what our task force is doing. We're uh, incredibly grateful to have Lauren participating on that task force and to be able to think with many of our colleagues from the educational segments about what that looks like. I was thinking that uh, saying that there needs to be a much warmer handoff from K-12 into our higher education system, for example. Um, and that is the kind of thing I was struck by just the number of students that, uh, in one of your, your charts that um, are going to four years, four years and how that is, is very different. We need to make sure that those connections are there because certainly we can't increase uh, the number of students with degrees unless we're getting them from K-12 to, to higher ed. So I just think that there are a number of things that we can be doing, but we have to do it really with a, a frame around equity first. And we should have a report around that um, out in early uh, 2021. Thanks, thanks, Londe. Uh, Lauren, uh, I'm gonna th throw in something else here too, is that you know, in the past, UC and CSU have partly weathered uh, these uh, financial downturns through increasing tuition. I know that that's politically not popular. It's probably not on the table in the, in the near term now. Um, but what can uh, CSU do to make sure they're still able to provide spaces for students and the services they need? Mm -hmm. uh, so thank you. And, and I appreciate the response from um, Lande as well. You know, the, I, I can't say that they are necessarily greater efficiencies. Uh, I can say that there's probably a shift in costs. I mean, if you think about how do you take a system of 23 universities with 55,000 faculty and staff um, and then you shift everything, well, maybe not everything, let's just say that we've gone primarily virtual, which means in, in our case, about 90 to 95% of our courses were moved from the face-to-face -face format to the virtual format. Now, some people may think that that just happens magically. 
uh, but it doesn't. Uh, it, it means that you've got to have the appropriate kind of support um, and professional development for faculty. Uh, you have to make sure that they've got the right kind of technology uh, that's available in their homes, uh, as well as the appropriate kind of uh, Wi-Fi service. Uh, and then you, you even double that further when you think about student needs. Uh, I know that we've been looking very carefully at, at the digital divide and how alive and well it really is in California, especially for those exact students that you've been looking at in this research, uh, students from economically challenged backgrounds as, those as, as well as those that come uh, from black and brown backgrounds, that we have had to work really, really hard to provide as much technology to these students so that they can stay uh, persistent with us. And that more importantly, that we've also shifted all of our uh, services, our support services to the virtual venue. So it, it's hard to say that it, it is more cost efficient. It certainly has become more efficient in our ability to make sure that every student is getting what they need in order for them to persist and to complete their degrees. But I can't say that it's more affordable. Okay, thanks. Um, so I'm gonna turn to audience questions now. We're running out of time. So I apologize to our audience. There's some good questions coming in. So the first one is uh, from uh, a viewer from Sacramento who asks, now that Proposition 16 has failed, uh, what can public, co public colleges and universities in California do to support Latino, and I'll add African-American and other underrepresented students to help them have access to and graduate with, with a degree? Um, I'll start. Um, certainly, we've already referenced pipeline programs. And you know, I don't want to just toss the term out there and just make it seem as if that as well just kind of magically happens. I'm, I'm really speaking of authentic programs uh, that you've heard me mention earlier in my comments where the campus really gets to know these students perhaps as early as eighth or ninth grade and um, that we are working with those students as they continually come to us each summer on a progressive basis um, and that they are uh, we're united with the schools for which they come from as well uh, in ensuring that we're providing the augmented uh, kind of uh, academic enrichment that's needed, as well as understanding their needs as early as eighth or ninth grade and following them and keeping them in our fold until they reach our doors. That's the authentic kind of pipeline programming that works effectively, especially when we're talking about those populations of students that are underserved. The other piece that I wanna just make sure of that, that we certainly have been working on um, and we've been having lots of discussions with the higher ed uh, equity task force at the governor's office level that uh, Lande mentioned, is ensuring that specifically our Latinx and our African-American students are receiving very intentional, proactive uh, uh, support and advisement to make sure that every step of the way that they know that they're being supported and when I'm talking about support, I'm not just talking about academic support, although that's a major part of it in terms of ensure that they're taking advantage of um, every opportunity for academic enrichment, but also looking at their personal development on the basic needs side that Marlene just mentioned, that you know, if they are food insecure, if they are housing insecure, if they need mental health services, that we're providing that even in the pandemic era, uh, to make sure that those needs are being addressed. And then obviously on the financial side as well, with a lot of the different micro grants that we have available to keep students persistent so that they don't feel like they have to stop out because they only have $500 or $1,000 that they need in order to square them up uh, to keep going. And so that's the kind of micro focus that really is important uh, in order to make sure that all of these students, particularly those that uh, coming from the Latin back, Latinx background as well as African American back, backgrounds, will not only just be have access to the CSU and to you, the UC, but that we know that we are preparing them to complete their degree programs and to go on and to do great things. Hans, if I might, just for one quick minute, another innovative approach that we are taking is last year the governor's budget provided $10 million to, um, to have a K 16 collaborative. In, uh, in Fresno. And that uh, collaborative is just kicking off. And the idea behind it is, is that we are gonna work with students throughout the pipeline, but really intensively starting in ninth grade to try and have 
uh, the CSU, the UC, our community colleges and our independent institutions bring together all of their resources to think about how do they move students through using faculty, using facilities, move through students through a pipeline that would end up with degrees in one of four areas that are linked to growth areas of that local economy. So we're trying to do that kind of innovative forward thinking that are not just about how do we prepare for today, but how do we prepare for tomorrow? And really thinking about for whom are we preparing tomorrow? And I think that the work that we're doing in Fresno around that initiative in particular, which Dr. Castro has been integrally engaged in um, is really important in terms of thinking about what are the new ways that we can, again, think about these students as being all our students and bring the resources to bear of all of our institutions to make sure that those with the greatest educational need are actually getting that kind of educational access, support and completion. Thank you. You know, we have another question that I'm gonna answer real quickly, which is whether the data that we presented is available by school district in California. And the answer is unfortunately no, it was very difficult to cobble together the, the, the data that we did uh, for this report, but um, parts of it are. And then finally, uh, when Londe and her team and colleagues are able to achieve a statewide longitudinal student data system, uh, similar to their efforts in Fresno in some ways, uh, we will be able to, and we're hopeful that within the next couple of years, we'll have something like that. And it is a challenge in our state and it could lead to efficiencies as well when we identify which of these students are UC or CSU eligible, but never even applied or could have gotten a Cal grant, uh, but didn't apply. And I know Marlene, you guys have done some innovative work looking at how students even reply or respond to, to, to their offer of admission of um, uh, the possibility of them getting a, a Cal grant. So uh, let me um, ask the next question and Marlene, maybe you could start uh, with an answer on this one. And that is what about non-traditional age students, students who are age 25 and over um, many of whom are, uh, again, uh, low income or working in jobs that are vulnerable to, to downturns. Yes, happy to take that one. Um, so we, in our Cal Grant modernization effort, we really thought a lot about this group of students, adult learners who were in careers or jobs that have become, you know, um, displaced because of the change in automation, the change in the manufacturing um, um, uh, industry. And so how do we design for them? And one of the things we did is we targeted uh, the Cal Grant 2, which is one of the, the components of the proposed Cal Grant program and really eliminated things like GPA. Uh, if you're 35 years old and you've been displaced and you're looking at some upskilling or retraining, what value is it to have to go back and dredge up your high school transcript? Um, so we're also looking at eliminating the competitive program so that it's not a lottery system and that students are clear if they meet these criteria, then they would be eligible, automatically eligible um, if they, if, uh, for a Cal Grant. So we thought a lot about those students and that a lot of those, about 250,000 of those students were not applying because they didn't submit their GPAs and they got tossed out. So we know that they're out there. We know that they're interested. Oops. Thanks, Marlene. You know, we're, we're coming to the end of our time. So I feel really bad. I know Lauren, uh, CSU does serve a lot of uh, what we would call non-traditional age students, those uh, over age 25. Londe, I know that's been at the heart of many of, uh, much of your work and concerns and, and continues to be. Um, I, will, I will say this, that um, at least from my perspective, the work that you all are doing, Lande, uh, Lauren, and Marlene, gives me hope. And um, I don't mean to be Pollyannish, but consistently in my work in higher education and with our partners throughout the state, the amount of goodwill, the amount of concern, the amount of effort directed towards these very issues that we've raised has, at least from my perspective, never been more acute and focused. Um, and I think there's, there's just uh, real avenues that we can, that we can pursue to, to move, move us all forward. So with that, I would uh, like to um, end the program. Uh, again, thank the panelists. Uh, and again, uh, thank our funders for making all of this uh, possible for those of us you you who um, and, uh, uh, signed up early uh, uh, for this program, you will get a survey uh, later on, uh, actually in a couple minutes. And please let us know how we did. It helps us improve these programs for the future. We could have talked for another hour or two. I know 
but we're not going to obviously. So uh, to everyone, please be be safe. Uh, and we look to, forward to seeing you at the next PPIC event. Goodbye.